Hello, everyone. Um, today, I'll be talking about uh, deterministic Docker images with Go microservices, as you can tell by the name of the talk. Um, first, um, some fun facts. Um, my name is John San Miguel. I also go by JSM. Um, I'm on JSM on the uh, Slack, Strange Loop Slack, if you want to find me after or talk to me. Uh, currently working at Samsara, and uh, as part of that, I'm working on observability right now, part of our core infrastructure team. And also, I have a cat. I have like no social media presence at all, but uh, my cat does have an Instagram. So if you want to follow my cat, go for it. Cool. Um, so first, let's talk about why this is even like valuable. Um, so in our, in our case, what we wanted to do was we wanted to make deploys as fast as possible at Samsara. And there's a few times, there's a few reasons why we might, might want to do that. There's um, some wins around developer velocity, um, being able to iterate on features um, as quickly as possible and push things out. Um, there's also a bunch of changes that sometimes need to wait for other changes to get deployed first before, before we can actually roll them out. Um, and there's also bug resolution time for customers. Um, just if you find a bug and fix it, it would be great if we can get it out as quickly as possible. Um, and so both of these things kind of lead to uh, happy engineers and happy customers. Uh, so before I get into it, I just want to talk a little bit about what we do at Samsara, um, just to get a better idea of what, we're, what this is for. Um, so we have a bunch of devices that get, gather a bunch of data from a bunch of various things, trucks, uh, machinery, um, industrial uh, applications, and then send that to our devices and send that to our cloud platform where we do a bunch of um, different things uh, around like analytics and uh, stuff for those companies. Um, I like to think of it as like basically Datadog for um, the real world metrics that you might find. And so to do this, what we do uh, for our stack is we have a uh, React, uh, React front ends for our mobile and, and our website. And those talk to our servers via GraphQL, which in turn talk to a bunch of microservices via gRPC, which are all built in Golang. Um, and we push this all out with BuildKite, um, Terraform, uh, onto ECS, and finally on Docker containers. And when I say we use Golang at Samsara, um, we use Golang a lot. Um, we use it for our services. We use it for our, uh, our uh, deploy orchestration. We use it for generating Terraform files. We use it for managing our teams and like configuring our teams via Golang struct. So everything in our backend is Go, which has actually been pretty great because everyone knows how to work in that kind of code base, and it like, makes working and integrating with different parts of our platform really easy. And when I say we have Golang microservices, uh, we have a lot of those, too, actually. Um, we actually have more microservices than, than engineers right now. Um, and I know you might be thinking, are microservices really that good? Um, I'm not going to go into that kind of argument. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts if you want to ask me about them, but we can talk about that another time. So instead, here's some pictures of my cat. Um, anyways, cool. So before we um, dive into the kind of pieces, let's talk about what determinism means in this context. Um, so what we're talking about here is byte for byte determinism, where you uh, compile and package the same exact code, and that should lead to the same exact Docker digest. Um, and so th the way this helps is uh, for a few things. It strips out time from having to move these Docker layers across the network from our CI systems for our different servers to new servers that come up as we auto-scale. Um, it also really helps when we, uh, for enabling no-op deploys for unchanged microservices, which saves a lot on uh, basically like shutdown and startup time of these services. And also, uh, there's less downtime on singleton services that we have where we can only run one. Uh, there's uh, it prevents a lot of initialization outages, like if you have to talk to uh, EC2 metadata service or talk to a config system or talk to your secret system. Um, once that gets started, then the services won't have to deal with those kind of issues if you don't have to take them down for no reason. Um, and so overall, you get a lot of speed and reliability gains from doing this. Cool. Um, so I want, also want to talk about what deploying a service looks like at Samsara. So basically, we compile a Go binary, we build it into a Docker image, and then we ship it to ECS. So to get there, I'll be talking about three different sections for this talk. Um, I'll be talking about how to make Golang compiles deterministic. I'll be talking about how to make Docker builds deterministic, and also how to reduce large dependency graphs. 
Um, and I'll be using reproducible and deterministic uh, kind of interchangeably in this talk, so they kind of essentially will mean the same thing uh, for what I'm talking about here. So the first thing, like I said, is uh, building uh, deterministic Golang binaries. Um, for, that's the first thing that we need to do to get anywhere. And there are some issues with this, uh, with Golang right now. Um, Golang includes paths of standard lib packages used in GoRoot. Um, there's, it includes paths of libraries used in GoPath. Um, if you use CGO for uh, uh, importing various C uh, dependencies, then the host linker generally includes paths of linked objects into the binary as well. And it also includes an arbitrary build ID in these binaries, which make uh, Golang right now not deterministic, even though it does intend to be. Um, and there's some different strategies you can use to tackle these different issues. Um, for the Golang paths, uh, there's a few kind of very vague um, or not well documented things that you can do. One of which is you, there's this go root final environment variable where you can change the go root path prefix um, to a static value. Um, there's also this trim path flag that they added in I think 1.9 or 10. Um, that allows stripping paths of libraries in the Go path down to just the import name. Um, we don't actually do either of these at Samsara. Um, what we do instead is we compile all of our services inside of these kind of identical build containers that we use in our CA and CD pipelines. So that kind of strips out these issues for us. And there's also this uh, host linker thing where um, we, you, there's different um, linkers that you can use. There's a host linker. There's a, you can use the Golang's internal linker. And if you use Golang's internal linker, then it doesn't include the paths of the linked objects in the binary and also does not include that build ID. And so we use this flag at Samsara um, with some whitelisted services that just don't work with the internal linker for various reasons. Um, and this gets us uh, most of the way to Golang uh, determinism. And what I want to talk about next is kind of just a dive into like, some stuff that has happened with this. Um, so Golang in 1.7 introduced a new compiler backend based on a uh, static single assignment form, um, where basically this is a, uh, a design principle of compilers where if you represent a program in this form, then the, it makes a lot of uh, it optimizations. Uh, it enables some optimizations that can't exist without it and also makes other optimizations a lot better. And so this uh, led to some big improvements in the compiler and performance speed of uh, package binaries. And this also introduced a, um, a regression at some point where essentially what would happen is that by using this SSA, um, divide instructions within, um, within the binary requ requires values in specific registers. And so if you have two subsequent divide instructions, then the result of those uh, need to be moved somewhere else before the second is issued. And so they made a fix to this at some point where basically, um, and this was introduced in 1.8 beta, where uh, when allocating registers, uh, before kicking out the existing value, they would copy it to a spare register if there is one. And so as part of this kind of a performance improvement, um, they added this code. And I'll let you guys take a look at this for a little bit and see if any, anyone who might be a compiler expert can see what's wrong with this code. Essentially what's happening here is that they have uh, this list of um, register copies and they're going through them and finding if they're, uh, they were never used and then if they, if they weren't used then they would basically free that register copy. And this was the code in case anyone thought of something similar. Um, this is the code that fixed that specific determinism issue. Um, so what's happening here is essentially that um, if you delete a register copy that is unused, um, that actually might potentially leave another register whose only use is pointing to that other register that you just deleted. And so what you might end up with if you just do this once is another unused register after you do this cleanup. And so what, this, what they added here is basically a loop where they just keep doing this until um, it gets to this if no progress break. And this progress thing only happens if they actually execute that inner block. And so they'll basically just keep going through all of the registered copies until um, they get to a point where they haven't deleted anything. And so this fixed the uh, determinism uh, issue in 1.8. And so to kind of just uh, highlight that a little bit more, um, 
So you have a registered copy pointing to another registered copy pointing to another registered copy. Um, you run this script, it deletes one, but now you have another one that's pointing to nothing. Um, and then so what they did is they just kept doing this, where you would do this again and again. Does anyone else have an, does anyone have an idea what happens when they do this for the last time? You might be thinking nothing, but it's actually another picture of my cat um, in a box. But yeah, so uh, eventually they get to this point where they get rid of all these unused or registered copies. And that's how they fix that determinism bug in Go. Cool. Um, so before I move on to the next part about how to make Docker builds deterministic, um, I'm just going to give you guys a little break, play, picture, uh, play a video of my cat. All right, now that we've uh, all been able to refresh our minds, let's talk about uh, deterministic Docker builds. Uh, so the next thing we want to do as part of this is we want to make our Docker builds uh, for our going bi binaries deterministic. Um, and so you might be thinking, some of you who are more familiar with Docker, that doesn't this kind of already work? Doesn't this already happen? If you have Do uh, when you run Docker builds, you can, they can use a cache, where basically if you run Docker build with the same exact input, um, it'll use the existing cache um, and use existing layers instead of having to build them again. Um, but what happens with pipeline deploys with this kind of caching mechanism? So if you look at kind of deploying a service, there's a build step, there's a deploy step. When you want to build that service again, you do it again, build, deploy, build, deploy. Um, so let's talk about doing this in a specific case where you have the first build is basically v1 of the service, and then the second one is v2, and the third build actually got triggered, but it's the same exact service and the code hasn't changed. Um, this will work just fine using cache if you do this in this kind of like single uh, pipeline kind of way, but if you move to um, this kind of pipeline uh, thing, uh, we, we did this to basically make our deploys happen as quickly as possible. We decided we did not need to wait for the pre previous version to deploy before releasing the next, or before starting to build the next version. And so the issue here that you might see is that um, we have this v2 deploy happening, but it hasn't finished, and so we can't actually use the cache from that deploy because it actually hasn't, been, hasn't finished deploying yet. And so what happens here is that even though there's a v2, the, the third deploy is the exact same version as the second deploy, um, it won't be able to use the cache, and thus it'll have to go through the whole build itself without using a cache, and that will end up with a different Docker uh, digest. And the reason for that, if we dive into that a little bit more, is that there's some issues with Docker reproducibility. They never really kind of intended for Docker to be completely deterministic. Um, run commands are just non-deterministic by nature. If you're doing an apt get for some packages, the repository could have changed the actual uh, code that you're actually apt get installing, and so you cannot actually rely on run to be deterministic at all. Um, the file system digest also includes m times, and so when it makes the, uh, the layer um, hash, it'll take into account that, and also it also includes a random, uh, a random hex string as an identifier, um, and not just the cryptographic hash of the layer content. And so to actually get around this, there's a few things that you can do. Um, one, don't use run. Uh, instead of using run, you can like basically build a base image that you uh, you build at like set intervals or manually uh, for any dependencies that need to be installed. Um, you need to reset m times across the file system, and you have to manually construct the Docker layer with their own identifier. And this is basically kind of just rewriting Docker with some stuff, um, with some with some changes. And so I started going off on this route, and I realized that there's actually something that does all this for you. Um, it's called Basil, um, built by Google, um, and so. Using Basil, they, uh, they do all that stuff for you, and if you use Basil, it comes out with a deterministic Docker image, where the, exact, where the Docker digest ex is exactly the same if you give it the exact same input. Um, so we use, we use it at Samsara. This is just some, a snippet of some of our configuration scripts. Like I said, we use Go for everything, and so we actually generate these via Go. Um, but um, the, interest, the thing to point out here is we use this base image called distroless, um, which is a Debian-based uh, bare-bones distro that from, whoa, 
from Google. Um, and so these images are basically like really stripped down. They don't contain a shell. They don't contain a package manager. Um, they only really contain your application and its runtime dependencies. Um, this makes it so you don't, for, for Go, you don't actually need dependencies for the most part because they're compiled into the binary. Um, and so this it works pretty well with Go. Um, and then it also like uh, fixes a lot of security problems in that you don't have a shell so people can't execute stuff in your, in your container. Um, you don't have a package manager, so people, you don't have to worry about like, checking SHAs and stuff. Um, and so it makes, it, it also has a bunch of the stuff that you actually need to run Golang images, um, sorry, Golang binaries. And so it works pretty well for Golang. They also have distro list images for various other languages, like I think they have one for Python and Java. Um, so you could take a look at their, um, their images for, for using uh, Bazel with this. Um, another thing I like to do is I like to tell potential candidates to, to, at Samsara that we've been using Docker for 50 years. Um, which is not true because Docker has only been around for like 10 years or so. But um, when I talked about earlier about how you have to reset the M times in the file system, if you do that, then you do a Docker images, it prints out all of your images, and it says it was built 49 years ago. Uh, so that's kind of nifty. Cool. Um, so the last thing that I want to be talking about here is uh, basically how you can minimize your dependency chains. Um, so determinism doesn't actually help with Golang if your code changes like way too frequently. Um, and this could happen because, um, uh, actually before that, I want to talk about what I talked about before. So just kind of coding myself. Um, so compiling and packaging the same code will end up with the same Docker digest. I want to kind of clarify what packaging, what the same code means in the, in the world of Go. Um, and so if you look at Go, uh, they have a, and you look at the internal linker, they have a dead code remover, but um, we use uh, Golang 1.11 right now. And in 1.11, um, unused static functions are removed from the binary, but they can they'll still actually change the, uh, the uh, digest of the binary. Um, also, if reflect is used, Golang can't ignore methods on structs. Um, Golang has a bunch. Golang has this reflection uh, package where you can basically pull out a method on a struct by name, and so because of that, you can't actually determine whether or not a method inside of a struct is actually used if the program imports reflect um, or specific methods of reflect. And so, if you use reflect, um, Golang, the Golang dead code remover cannot actually strip out um, any methods on your structs. And by, by doing so, even if you don't use any of these unused functions or you don't use any of these methods in your code, as long as you use something else in that package, the binary, will, uh, the binary output will include information around that package. And so essentially, um, when we're talking about the code being the same in Golang, we're really talking about the package being the same. Um, and so if any part of the package or its imports changes, then the binary changes. Um, this is mostly true. Um, and it's, it's a pretty good assumption to make, although it might not be true in all cases. Um, and so based off of this kind of information, um, you, can't make any, uh, you can't make any assumptions about this. your service only includes this function. All you've changed is that one function in your, in your program. And so, um, sorry, if, if another function in your, in, your program, in your package has changed, even if you don't imp actually use that function, um, your, your binary will still change. Um, so that kind of uh, makes things a little bit more difficult because now you have a bunch of code that you might not even be looking at or using, and those change, and it affects your, bin uh, it affects your binary. Um, and so uh, if you, another way to kind of think about it that I like to use as a metaphor is for anyone who's read or watched Ender's Game, they have this weapon called the Little Doctor, and essentially what it does is it shoots this giant laser beam, um, and but it only works if the actual things that it's targeting are close enough together where it ca can cause a chain explosion slash reaction. Um, and so I want you to think of this laser as your build or CI system. And I want you to think of all those alien ships as your microservices. And what you don't want is for your microservices to explode into a fiery death. Um, and so kind of uh, playing off this metaphor, what you need to do for your services is you need to keep them far enough apart where they're not too dependent on any shared code, 
um, where it would cause a chain reaction of changing one thing actually propagates changes to all of your other microservices. And then even if you're using determinism, like you change one small helper library and then everything just starts deploying anyways. Um, so there's a, that, that was probably the hardest challenge out of this whole, out of this whole project was to uh, make this better. And so um, we wrote two tools to help with this. Uh, there's one called Depstat, which is for dependency analysis, and there's one called Import Checker, which uh, disallows in certain uh, imports with certain rules. Um, and I'm currently working on open sourcing these. I'll give you guys a link to the uh, base repo um, that is currently empty, but will be pushed there once it's ready. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about what this does and how it works. Uh, basically, it builds a graph of a all of your services and what they import and all of their direct imports, all their child imports. And after building this graph, there's a lot of cool nifty things that you can do with that. Um, so one of the commands in Depstat is counts. Um, so I run this command and I can actually see the number of services that are being, uh, that are using a particular package. And so in this case, this is uh, sorted by the least frequently imported. We have a bunch of packages that are only being imported by one service. Um, but we also have a bunch of packages that are being imported by a bunch of services. And if you find a package that you see that's being imported by all of your services with this tool, you can dig into that a little bit. And you can run uh, the step set package um, command, which will you pass in a package, and it'll tell you all of the services that are dependent on that particular package. Um, in this case, uh, we're, I'm using it to kind of look at this leg uh, imports of this legacy system. Um, this is kind of one of our you know, everyone has legacy code lying around. Um, we have a few services still using that, and this is a tool to help us identify um, which of those services are still using that. Um, and this legacy system also uh, does dependency, uh, does not use dependencies very well. Um, for our services, we use this thing called FX to do dependency injection, which allows us to add in dependencies like our Datadog client, um, our, uh, um, our like, log client and a bunch of other like various things we might want to inject into runtime without actually having to call imports at, in the actual code layer. Um, and so one of the things that I worked on was also helping deprecate services that use this legacy system. Uh, we have over like 200 services, so now there's probably around 20 left. So did a pretty good job there of getting that done. Uh, there's this other command in Depstat, which is uh, probably the coolest one. Um, it's called Depstat deploys, and it walks through all of the commits and will basically tell you um, this commit changed this particular package, which caused these particular services to deploy. And you can kind of use this to kind of to get a better idea of how bad your dependencies are. If you see a deploy and it seemed to trigger all of your services to change, um, you can find the commit and find what caused that, what package caused that propagating deployment. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is this stepstat command called y. Which, uh, so you found a service that was deployed and you, and you saw it was deployed because of the change inside of another package. Um, it's not easy to walk the import tree um, to actually understand why this package is being imported by our service. And so this tells you about how this actual package was, is being imported. So you can see here that legacy system is imported by this thing called stat server, which is imported by this thing called compliance service router. And now it's imported by the, ser by the service that we're looking at. Um, so that's Depstat, and the other tool I talked about was Import Checker. Um, so Import Checker basically gives you a way to define these rules on different um, packages, and you can say essentially that I have this package, and no one can imp no one can import it. Um, and then you can also provide a whitelist that kind of overrides that, and you can say, well, these particular services can import it, and this is good for basically helping you. Pr uh, keep people from importing code that you've identified should not be imported by everyone. Um, cool, so you have these tools, but there's also a bunch of code patterns that you kind of have to do um, that you can't, that it's hard to write tooling for. Um, but basically you wanna break up the, uh, large packages. You, we had a giant helpers package, uh, you might have one too, that has a bunch of various helper functions in code. Um, so you want to break that up into smaller packages. You also want to move commonly used configs, constants, and types into their own sub-package. Um, and also you want to split frequently changed code from the more static portions. So say you have, for example, a, um, a configuration object 
that lists like the names of your services and how many of those you want to deploy at the, t at the same time. And you have a bunch of other code that takes that and then like will generate, or is, you have other code that's like orchestration tooling that will use that configuration to do whatever you're doing. Um, the actual orchestration code itself probably won't change much. Like the way you're actually taking this configuration and deploying stuff, the code itself probably won't change much. But if you're, if you're changing the configuration a lot, then that will cause that particular package to change all the time. Um, and so by splitting up uh, frequently changed code for the more, from the more static code, then that helps with this kind of dependency chain reaction thing. And also you want to vendor your dependencies properly. Um, Golang has a vendor directory thing and there's a, a bunch of various dependency or package managers in Go. I think the, the official one is now like Vigo. Um, but you want to make sure that you're pulling your dependencies in a static way, either checking them into vendor or pulling them based off of a specific version or, or hash. So that way your vendor libraries aren't causing a chain reaction of binaries to change um, by like doing like changing something that you might not even use. So it's good to kind of just vendor, uh, vendor your packages in a more deterministic way. And this was kind of the uh, result of how, of what happened here, um, where essentially we, this was before, and this was after. Um, so what we're, what we're doing here is we're basically building all of our services in the, and we're deploying all of them. Um, and so this took about an hour and a half in, in some cases on a, in our previous deploy system. Um, and by doing, making this change, we were able to cut down build times by quite a bit. Um, and so at some point, we were pretty much deploying like three times an hour. And when I say deploying, I mean deploying hundreds of different microservices at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, it was a pretty successful project. Um, and so the last thing I just want to go over is a summary of what I talked about here. Um, so the first step to this was making our Golang compiles deterministic. Uh, the second step was making our Docker builds deterministic. And then the third step was reducing these large dependency graphs. Um, that's the end of my talk. Um, I'm going to save the rest of the time for Q&A. Uh, but if you want to reach out to me, um, I'm github.com slash jsm, jsm at samsara.com. Uh, my cat's Instagram handle, again, is prince.of.meow. And that repo that I told you about where I'll be pushing uh, the depstat code will be in github.com slash samsarahq slash depstat. And lastly, I put in some thanks for Let's Encrypt for, they provided some notes that I, that I used as a reference for some of the deterministic Golang stuff, um, and also slidescarnival.com for these slide templates. Cool. Um, any questions? What's up? Oh, maybe. Um, I'll look into that. Uh, yeah, we're still using Go Vendor. Um, I'm not sure if like uh, Vigo has actually been like is out of beta, and so we're kind of waiting for uh, to, for that to get out of beta before we move to that. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not following your question. Uh, so even though in your code you may not be importing that original code base, you're importing the new library. Mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason, the Go module keeps trying to pull in the uh, original code base instead of the new library, even though it's specifying the new library. I'm assuming by some of this explicit that's a big uh, that you're doing to prevent some of that. Um, yeah, I think. I'm not sure how Vigo works like right now. Um, they probably like figure out which packages you're importing based off of looking at stuff, um, and you might like it might only reference like it might pull things based off of like uh, function signatures and package signatures, and you might need to like actually like pin it to a specific version if you needed to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think there's, so Basil also includes, has, has its own like Go uh, rules to like uh, build Go binaries and then uh, also they, I think they have some dependency management that they can do themselves as well. So I think that there might be other tools for this as well. I am building, uh, sorry, no. No, I'm not building Go binaries with Basil. No. Uh, yeah, because they, in, in Basil, there's a similar tool that is called Basil Query that does the dependency and how they're supposed to address that. Um, does it, um, have, you, have you used it before? Um, yeah. Does it kind of solve the similar, like, similar problems? OK. Take a look at that, too. Cool. Any, anything else? Sweet. Well, uh, that's the end of my talk, and I'll stick around for any questions that anyone might have. Um, probably over here. So come find me. Also, I uh, want to give a shout out to Samsara for sponsoring this event as well. Uh, we have a table on the first floor downstairs. Um, so I'll also be hanging out there as well if you want to come chat with some of us. Also, Joy right there is also at Samsara if you want to talk to her about mobile stuff. Cool, thanks.